Hey, Chicago Fire fans. Welcome back to Feed the Fire, a Chicago Fire MLS podcast. We are recapping the Chicago Fire's second match at Philadelphia Union, and I'm going to try to stay positive despite the result and the play and the lack of discipline and the lack of tactics. We'll get into that. I just want to remind you all that our podcast is sponsored by Skira Icelandic Spring Water, available at your local 7-Eleven. All the, the water and mineral content you need to quench those vocal cords after screaming at your local club. Now let's get right into this episode. We are going to talk about the recap uh, of the loss to Philadelphia. We are going to discuss the statistics in the game, if you're into that sort of thing. Uh, we're going to take a short sponsor break and get some additional podcast commentary from our guest and featured contributor, John Donovan. And then we're going to talk about some of the other kind of non uh, X's and O's portions of the game. Like, I don't know, your star player and most expensive signing club history walking around um, and things like that. Also, we're going to talk a little bit fire news, the kind of outrage on social media, if you want to call it that, um, about some of these new ticket offers, and then we'll touch on a few headlines from around the league. So let's now look at this one nothing loss at Subaru Park to the Philadelphia Union. Uh, quick summary, it was Torres with the goal in the 90th minute. That's not just heartbreaking, that is just devastating from an emotional standpoint, as well as a on the field, like you you think you've doing, done everything to earn a point on the road, and then bleh, you have one defensive lapse, and there you are, you're down, you lose any sort of points in that match, right? What happened on this play, what, what at least stood out to me is you have Philadelphia building up and the fire are scrambling to get back into their defensive shape. And that back line of the defense just kind of kept backing up and backing up. And the player that was marking Torres, and I forget who it was right now, just kept backing up. So Torres is about 23, 25 yards out from the goal line. And the defender like backpedals into his own 18. So Torres takes that space and is about 18 to 20 yards out, just lets one fly, takes kind of a, a funny hop. It was one of those balls that was you know, just a few inches off the ground. It dips right before it gets to Brady, hits the ground, and then pops up. Now, the goalkeeper's got to do better anticipating that, no doubt. And Brady had a great game. It was one of the bright spots, and it was great to see him coming in game two, week three of the season, and he is able to, to come up with some good saves, command his line, but then have this lapse in the last minute of the game. So, I, I hate to put all of this on Brady because usually a, a goal is a result of a bunch of things going wrong, a turnover uh, in your own half, a defense who's not set in their shape, a player who's backpedaling and a goalkeeper who doesn't read the shot correctly. Um, but Brady did have a good game, so I'm not going to harp on him too much on that one. Uh, but that is what happened to me on this play. And if you look at the goal that we gave up against New York City, that the fire gave up against New York City, it was the same thing. You had a backpedaling defense, which gave New York City the space to shoot. And the fire need to know if they're at the 18, you hold that line. You can't backpedal into your own box. You got to step up and let the attacking player make a decision whether to pass back, to shoot, to try to dribble, to do something, force them to make a decision that they're not ready for. So that really kind of upset me. As good as the defense has been, over the last year or so, give or take a few terrible matches and give or take a few individual performances that were subpar, the defense has been okay, especially our center backs. But And, and you saw Philly try to bring the ball up the wings quite a bit during this game. Uh, and, and so that also tells you that the center backs have been pretty, pretty good for the fire. Um, but they got to get that shape and they have to know where their line of confrontation is. Personally, I don't think the line of confrontation should ever be inside your own 18. Something to work on for next week. Also, looking at that game, I'm going to say it real quick now, and I'm not going to say it again. The officiating was terrible, but that's not why the fire lost. You know, the, we, we've already discussed um, the breakdown on the goal. We've already discussed the the injuries, lack of um, players available and talent in other episodes. And we're going to talk about some more reasons why the fire didn't win this game. But it wasn't because of the officiating, as terrible as the officiating was. Um, the fire, unfortunately, I think 
had a little carryover from last season and already are establishing themselves as a team that doesn't like the refs and will argue with the refs. And they are going to get these descent yellow cards more frequently if this continues. And they are going to continue to see the opposing team not get penalized. I mean, Philly should have had at least two more yellow cards. Uh, the Glesnes hit to Shabilko's head could have warranted a red card, let alone a, a, an obvious yellow there. But they didn't get it, right? The other problem I see is in this particular game with this particular official, a good referee should not use yellow cards to control the game. Use their whistle, talk to the players, calm things down, but don't use yellow cards as a way to control the game. And that's what this official did. His name is Guido Gonzalez Jr. He's been refing in the MLS for five years. He had 21 matches as the head official last season and 13 before that. He's no stranger to the game. He was actually the USL Referee of the Year in 2019. Here's the other thing, though. In this game, he gives out nine yellow cards, I think. He also refereed week one as a head ref, Orlando Red Bulls. Seven yellow cards. He is quick to the pocket. Now, I haven't compared that to the rest of the league. Maybe there's some sort of point of emphasis, to borrow an NFL phrase, that referees want to give these yellow cards out and establish control and let the players know who's in charge. But again, I think that's a terrible way to do it, and I have never heard anything from pro referees. Uh, not that I'm seeking out pro referee you know, press conferences or anything. Do they have those? Not that I've heard anything from pro or anyone covering the game that they have these sort of ways to control the game through red cards but and yellow cards. But again, I don't want to harp on this too long. I've gone more than I've wanted to. The Chicago Fire did not lose this game and did not play poorly because of the officiating, though it certainly didn't help. My three main takeaways from this game um, are that I never expected the Fire to win, but I found myself in that second half like cheering for the draw. Like, come on, guys, let's just hold on for this second half and we'll walk out of Philly with a point. That's not a good place to be as a team or a fan. Now, if you go in with the mentality of, look, we're going to we're gonna play a good game. We're gonna, if we can come away with a point on the road, that's a solid result, especially against a team who is the defending Eastern Conference champion and the preseason favorite to win the East again. However, I don't think the fire came into it with that mentality. We heard uh, the post-game press conference from Ezra Hendrickson say like, well, I set up two blocks in the middle of the field and we were just going to try to make Philly break us down. Great. That has nothing to do with offense, how you plan to actually attack the Philadelphia union, unless it was just, we're going to lob some long balls over the top and hopefully Shabilko gets lucky, which hasn't been the case for over a year, or maybe Kai gets on a one. I, I don't know. So they came in, you know, not with a plan to win with just a plan to respond to Philly. And I think that's kind of weak to be perfectly honest. And I would never want to play on a team. That's like, Hey guys, in this game, we're going to go out to not lose. So the fire need to change the mental attitude, change the culture and bring instill a winning culture, go out and say, look, we may not have the players available. We may not have the talent, but we're going to go out there and we're going to compete with these guys and we're going to do everything we can to steal three points and or walk away with a point. Not We're just going to sit and defend and just, just let Philly come at us and see if they can break us down for 90 minutes because eventually that Philly Union team will break you down and it did take them 90 minutes and they did it and the Fire have now nothing to show for what Ezra may have come out and said was a really good defensive effort had they walked away with a point. Can't do that when you lose. So that was a big gamble on his part, and it, it did not pay off. Um, again, the Fire just don't have the talent and the depth right now where we should be saying, like, oh, they should go out and be able to win win games even on the road. We'll get to that point, but it doesn't seem like the front office and the coaching staff are trying to get to that point uh, despite not having the, the talent, right? They're just facing a reality that, meh, another bad season. Let's all be in for it. At least have the courtesy like the Cubs did years back to say, hey, guys, we're going to suck for a few years, but then we're going to win a World Series. And it worked out and the fans bought into it and everything like that. And if I've learned anything from my time as a manager in the corporate world, you need buy-in from your team members, right? You need buy-in from the fans in this case and from the players to say, guys, this is not going to be a good season. We are going to fight and do everything we can, but the goal is to make the playoffs and that's it. Like, and they keep saying it, 
that the goal is to make the playoffs, but I just don't believe it when I hear it from them because nothing else shows that that's the goal, at least to this point. Okay, let's move on. The other the other takeaway from this game, discipline. Discipline is an issue. Five yellows resulting in two reds against the fire. Kamara gets a first half yellow card for dissent, arguing with the ref. I'm sure he said the magic words because it didn't look like I mean, arguing with the ref when one of your players gets knocked down, yeah, that's going to happen. But the ref didn't look like he was getting too frustrated with Kai, and then all of a sudden, yellow card. So I'm sure there were some magic words in there. Uh, Herbers gets a yellow card for mixing it up with Martinez, and it ends up being a double yellow card, which, to me, that's an officiating cop-out. Like, you are clearly losing control. You didn't assert control when they were initially scuffling. You didn't pull a yellow card or give double yellow cards when when their foreheads were touching and their button heads like a couple of rams who are trying to find the right female ram. You know, he waits until everything's done and then gives them a double yellow. Like he lost control and again is using yellows to assert it. But still, for Herbers needs to walk away from that, right? You also had Tehran and Navarro. Miguel Navarro getting first half yellow cards for some bad fouls. Okay, your defenders are going to come in and crunch some guys. I can live with that. But what I like from Tehran is he he started to lose his cool and was able to regain his composure when he was getting in the wall uh, to defend against the free kick after he gave up that yellow card foul. You see Chihos come over to him and say, hey, Get your head back in the game. We need you. At least that's what I'm assuming he says to him because then Tehran calms down and has a decent game uh, for the rest of the time he was on the pitch. So good for Chihos. I'd like to see more. I'd like to hear some more comments from the coaching staff about how they're working with their defenders on just sort of those things. When you got two defenders getting yellow cards for some crunching tackles and then starting to lose their cool, coaching staff's got to come up with a better way to address it. This was a problem last year and it has not been addressed. And again, it only compounds the depth issues. When you guys, when you've got guys getting red card suspensions and yellow card accumulations, and you've got to rotate guys out because you don't want them picking up red cards. It's already compounding your depth issues. Another strike against the coaching, if you ask me, and I'm not going to look too much at CZ Brown or Zach Thornton because we have seen exactly how they are working with these guys. To me, this is on the head coach and the assistant coach. It's on Ezra. It's on Klopas. Also, uh, my other takeaway here are the tactics. We mentioned that Ezra said we're going to set up in two uh, blocks of four to clog the middle of the field and force Philly to play through us. Again, that's pretty much just admitting that you don't have anything offensively to do, right? They don't have the talent to compete yet, but we need to instill the winning mentality. So when the talent is there, when you bring in this DP, magical DP number nine, that he fits into the winning culture, winning mentality, he fits into the locker room, and then it's not disjointed, or he doesn't feed off of whatever this negative energy or the uh, acceptance of mediocrity that's currently going on. Also, no ideas moving the ball forward. I wanted to see Haile Selassie get in that game. This was a guy who lit it up in preseason, who had some good contributions when he came off the bench in the New York City game. The game was begging for him, and he remained on the bench. Um, I put out a tweet that if you look at the Fire's passing chart, everything was in the middle of the field. Why didn't we get anybody in the wings? Now, I did get a good, a good response that they didn't have the players, right? The, due to injuries and player availability and yellow cards and red cards, they just didn't have the guys on the wings. But still, throw in Haile Selassie, let him get in, into the channels. Mueller was not getting into the channels. It seems like this was a tactical choice by the coaching staff, and it did not pay off. All right, let's take a quick look at the statistics here. And does that match up with the eye test? So the fire had 45% possession, a lot higher than I thought it would be. And... Most of that possession, though, came in the first, I would say, 30, 40 minutes of the game. If you look at the possession charts, it really tilts into Philly's favor into that second half. Obviously, the red card is a factor there. But even then, the Fire, who are a team who can knock the ball around the back line pretty well, uh, and we saw them do it against New York City when that's where most of their possession numbers came from, defensive half of the field, defenders passing the ball around, um, they, they were still giving up a lot of possession in that second half. 12 shots, two on goal. Okay. Um, their passes was up this game. They had 369 passes with a 
accuracy, 70% completion rate on their passes. So there was up about 100 passes from last week, which which shows some improvement. Uh, but again, the accuracy of the passes was about 66% in the opposing half and in the attacking third. So you're seeing them probably have around 75 to 80% of their completed passes are all in the defensive half. Only two corners. So again, not getting down into the channels, 13 crosses and two offsides. So they're not getting into those dangerous wing areas that they like. So it was clearly to me an admission by the team that we just don't have the players or the talent to do it in this particular game. Um, so they tried to win differently and it did not work. Only six tackles won, but that's same for Philly. So kind of a wash there. 24 clearances to Philly's 14. So you can see the defensive pressure was on. And of course, according to the MLS statistics, four yellows and two reds. But uh, I think in reality, that was six yellows resulting in two reds there. Also, if you like XG, the Fire actually won the XG battle. 1.4 expected goals to Philly's 1.1. However, half of their expected goals, according to MLSsoccer.com, came from three shots. It was Chihos' toe poke early on when he was like at the six-yard box. So by XG standards, that's a very high percentage chance. I think that was a 0.5. Um, out of, so that was about a third of, of their XG right there. Despite him falling away from goal and just kind of toe poking it out, they are crediting that as a pretty good opportunity because of the distance uh, from goal. And then the rest, uh, and then the other half of their XG comes from uh, Shabilko and Kamara headers, right? And Shabilko had that great opportunity, couldn't steer it away from the goalie enough. Well read by the keeper on that one. And those are all in the first half. So half of the Chicago Fires. Uh, expected goals comes from three shots all early on in the first half. And again, just like last season, you miss early opportunities and it comes back to bite you. All right. So here on the podcast side, we are going to allow our featured and our featured guest, John Donovan, uh, to add his comments on the YouTube side. I'm going to quickly pause and allow that audio to get spliced in. And I want to thank Skira Icelandic Spring Water for sponsoring the show and for being a sponsor uh, of John Donovan's segment. Remember, Skira is Icelandic for clear. It's water that comes from a spring in a government-protected nature preserve in Iceland with naturally low mineral content. It's not your average water. Clearly, pun intended, it's one of the best, and it's available at your local 7-Eleven. Go out and get a bottle of Skira. Okay, other th observations from the game. Um, people were talking about Shakiri walking again, and he was subbed out early, and how dare he ask to get subbed out. The team needs you. You're the highest paid player. You're the best player. How dare you not do – Look, clearly he – he it was a defensive scheme, right? We, we've established that. The fire came in to play defense in this game. Shakiri is not playing defense. <clears throat> <clears throat> Let me, uh, gosh, I need my Skira here. Shakiri does not play defense. Plus, the dude was getting hacked and not getting the calls for whatever reasons we've discussed earlier. Additionally, he was having some hamstring tightness, and you don't want to pull a hammy. I don't know what's going on. Do we need to talk about hamstrings? Not just with the fire having like five or six guys experience tightness and pulls, but around the league, there's a lot of players. Are we, are we starting too early? Is preseason not good enough, long enough, or too intense? Um, is it the cold? Why, you know, why can't we schedule the, the all the March matches in Houston, Dallas, Miami, <laughs> LA? Um, then again, LA did get hit with a snowstorm in week one. So who knows, right? Anyway, I'm not getting into a scheduling discussion or a length of season discussion. But when, when you have your de facto best player, one of your best distributors of the ball, and, and one of your best offensive creators – coming into a defensive structure and then feeling hamstring tightness. I'm not going to fault him too much again. Plus he was getting hacked. Um, and I, I want to play to win and I want Shakiri to do more to help to win. Obviously his effort is quite, it, 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 it's completely fair to question his effort. Um, but again, we can't, if we want to compete, we can't lose our best player for long stretches of the season, gutting out and then pulling a hamstring in Philly um, in March. Right. And he, and here's the other thing. People are coming in and saying, Hey, look, if we would, you know, it's a, it's, it's just a one, nothing loss at Philly who may be the best team in the Eastern conference. That's not terrible. Okay. Then don't fault Shaq for, for wanting to come out early. 
I don't think people can have their cake and eat it too with those kind of arguments. All right. Now, another observation of some play on the field. And this is just my like anti Shabilko stance. I, I didn't like the pickup last season. I get why they did it. He's not performed and he's still not performing. I guess he's kind of lucky that Kai got the red card because if Kai can't play next week, then Shabilko has to play because I don't think Kutsius, um is going to be 90 minute ready or 90 minute trusted at that point. Despite the fact they need something, might as well give the kid a shot. A shot. Um, and I don't know if they want Bezerra playing more than a half at this point either, which is strange. I don't know why we haven't seen him yet. Um, so yeah, I think Shabilko will probably get the start just because he's the only one uh, that they probably trust, but at least he he looked ready to play in this game. He came ready to play and, and it just doesn't seem like he's getting the breaks and maybe he just doesn't have the it thing that these strikers have. Maybe he's got the yips, though, you know, 18 month yips are a strange thing. Um, but honestly, if it were me... I, fine. If you want to start Shabilko for the first half and see what happens, fine. Maybe you are trying to drive up his trade value, whatever the case may be. But if he doesn't score in that first half next match, get Bezerra in there, get Kutsius in there. That's the only thing we can do. Get those guys some MLS minutes and see what you have with your new signing and with your homegrown. And again, the last minute laps, we talked about that early on. I don't know if it is just kind of the early season and, and they're not mentally ready for 90 minutes. But again, got to do better there. Um, we're already way past 20 minutes, my my usual target. So I'm going to run quickly through a little bit of the fire news. Nothing as far as transfers or injury updates that I've seen yet. But we'll try and kick out another episode right before the, the weekend matchup with all of that. Um, but the big thing I've seen is people on social media, especially season ticket holders, are really mad that the Chicago Fire are offer, were offering a buy one, get one free ticket deal uh, on March 12th only. Um, you could buy any number of tickets for any number of games and get one free. And the season ticket holders are mad because price-wise, that is very similar to the season ticket package. So why buy season tickets if the Fire are going to do this every year? Now, if the incentive is to buy season tickets for playoff priority, well, that's no incentive, especially this season, right? But season ticket holders do get a bunch of other perks. Now, the, if the main concern is pricing, then the fire organization are out of touch with their main support base. They're, they're season ticket holders. And it's also a bad look three weeks into the season that they're desperate to sell tickets. A reminder, the home opener was announced at 19671 Now, there were not that many people in the stands. The rumors are they gave away thousands of tickets. And you also have to assume your home opener is going to be one of your best crowds. Maybe when the weather breaks in Chicago, they're going to get fifteen to 18000 a week with these BOGO deals, with these giveaways, with the season ticket holders coming back. Maybe if they get a, a big signing over the summer transfer window, that'll get people coming. But it didn't happen last year. I'm not going to look forward to it happening this year. Um, but I do give the front office credit for trying to do something to generate interest and revenue and ticket sales and if they can convert a percentage of these BOGO purchasers into season ticket holders, then, hey, mission accomplished. Now, from around the league, a few other headlines. Um, Seattle's the only team with three wins so far. The only other expansion franchise to do that, I believe, is Seattle. So they're in good company with Seattle. Um, there are three teams who have no points. Charlotte and Montreal are three losses in three games, and Houston is two losses in two games. Also, three teams have not scored a goal. Kansas City, Montreal, and Colorado have not scored. So Kansas City picking up where they left off the last two seasons without much offense, despite creating some good opportunities against a struggling Galaxy defense. Um, Montreal not going the way they wanted to, losing their coach, their culture setter, as well as their top playmaker, Mihailovic. They need to really get things figured out fast if they're going to compete for a playoff spot. Um, though Montreal sucking does help the fire. Uh, and Colorado also haven't scored a goal. You got to figure things out. Any Colorado fans out there? Is is their coach on the hot seat? I, I I feel like that year they won the West two seasons ago was a bit of a blip, was a bit of an anomaly and the exception to his style of play and, and the way they want to play and, and the way uh, they're kind of building their roster. But let me know. I could be wrong on that. Maybe they that is how they want to build, and, and maybe they want to 
be a small market team and they're okay not being top four every year as long as they make the playoffs. I don't know. I don't know. Um, but I'm not sold on Colorado's uh, head coach whose name escapes me at this point. Um, also, it's still early on, so I'm going to stay away from other general takes on these teams. Uh, but if I were any of those teams who has not won a game or has not scored a goal, I might be getting a little worried. Now, that is our episode. Please make sure you find us on YouTube, uh, on Twitter, on Facebook at Glasshouse Soccer. Like, subscribe, follow along. Make sure you rate and review if you're listening to your podcast. Uh, and you can always email me with feedback, glasshousesoccer at gmail.com. Thank you all. Have a wonderful week.